I praise the Lord. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. God set them in place forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and he gave them a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord. I'm Shelvis Smith Mather, a missionary for the Reformed Church in America, and I'm thankful to worship with you. Amen. Well, let us do just that. Let's worship him this day and praise the Lord. Let's stand together and sing. Sure. 
In your name you took the blind man You gave him back his sight In your name you took the dead man And you brought him back to life In your name you took this prisoner It's good to be together, isn't it? Praise to sing songs of worship to our great God who is so worthy of it. Our catechism this morning comes from the New City Catechism, question number 42, and it asks this question. How is the word of God to be read and heard? Let us recite and confess this truth together. With diligence, preparation, and prayer, so that we may accept it with faith Store it in our hearts and practice it in our lives. Short, succinct, but powerful. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm excited. (laughs) Have you noticed something on the stage this morning? This doesn't normally look this way if you're new this morning, um, but Vacation Bible School starts this week. So we're excited to kick off this week of Vacation Bible School with sharing this morning our theme song and inviting up our very own Power Up Dancers for Vacation Bible School this week. And kids, get excited. This is your theme song for the week. And after they're done, you can be dismissed to go back to your uh, Sunday school classes. But participate, get to know this song, because we're going to be having some fun with it this week. We are making it 
Vacation Bible School, I don't know what will. So thanks so much, treasure singers, power up singers, dancers. <laughs> treasure singers was about five years ago, I think. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Just one, thank you. I want to uh, first remind you to fill out your welcome card, put it in the offering plate later on in the service. Also, as Dan mentioned, a big thank you to the VBS singers, the power up dancers. Uh, for sharing their time and sharing the theme song for this year's Bible School. It will officially begin tomorrow night. Oh yes, I forgot to mention the kids are running off. I probably should have said kids run off. So, there you go, kids. Today uh, will be the last day to pre-register your children or anybody else you may know that would want to attend Vacation Bible School. You can register online or you can register in the fellowship area in the back uh, of the service or after the service in the back of the church. We want to be prepared for the rush tomorrow, so if you could pre-register, that will help things go a little bit smoother as people are flowing through tomorrow evening around 6 p.m. If you've never been to VBS before, please try to attend one of the nights this week. Anytime between 6.30 and 9 p.m., you'll be able to see the high level of energy in the building and see how much God is being praised all week long during the Vacation Bible School. Also, we want to give out a thank you to everybody who donated any of the materials we were using in Vacation Bible School, especially the big gorilla. That was a nice donation. Anybody who is able to stay after this service, we would really appreciate some extra hands hauling these chairs out of the sanctuary into the storage area. So if you do have a couple minutes after the 1030 service, we could use a couple extra hands clearing out the chairs in preparation for Vacation Bible School. Next, uh, starting today at noon... And all Sundays in July, we'll be having our new membership class. If you want to become a member or know somebody that is interested in either becoming a member or just finding out more about our denomination and our congregation here at BRC, the session will be at noon and will go till about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So again, starting today and following on through every Sunday throughout the month of July from 12 to 1 will be our new membership class. We also have some upcoming events. Uh, just an FYI, between August 9th and 14th, we will be taking photos for a new directory we'll be publishing. So we'll be getting more details in the upcoming week, but if you want to pencil in on your calendar, that new directory photos will be the week of August 9th through the 14th. Also, on August 11th will be our BRC Church Picnic. We're hoping to have live music this year, so if you or anybody you know would be interested in participating in a band or in the music at the Church Picnic, please see Pastor Dan. And finally, it's that time of year. It's been getting a little bit warm, and believe it or not, the rain has slowed down a little bit. So the green, yes. So the Green Thumb team will need some help watering the different landscaping areas around the church throughout the week. If you do have some time it can help out with watering and any of the beds around the church, please write watering on your, uh, on your welcome card or see Pastor Dan or Pastor Jay anytime after the service. Thank you very much. Well, let us stand again as Abel and uh, continue our song of praise. Where did God speak? I'm in myself.
that it will pour down on us like rain to wash our eyes with your majesty. We ask that we will be able to hear your prayer and to learn, to learn from your word this morning. We give you thanks for this day, dear Father. We thank you that we are able to... All 
right. Good morning, everyone. <sighs> Sermon title for this morning is a question that I want you to think about this morning. Are you a good communicator? It's a tough one. It's a tough one. But I want to do this. Let me ask you by already making you uncomfortable. Let's do that and start out very well this morning. Close your eyes and bow your heads because I want everybody to be honest about this one, all right? Close your eyes and bow your heads and raise your hand if you think you're a good communicator. Raise your hand if you think you're a good communicator. Wow, you know, I have written in my sermon, that's a whole bunch of hands, but that's really not actually a whole bunch of hands. You can raise your heads up, thank you very much. I thought it was going to be a little bit more like if I would have said, raise your hands if you think you're a good driver, and everybody's hand goes up. Because everybody thinks they're a good driver, but there are a whole bunch of not good drivers on the road. I don't, I don't think it's you. Don't hear me say that. But there's a whole bunch of not good drivers on the road. But everybody I talk to thinks they're a wonderful driver. Well, apparently not everybody knows that they're not necessarily a wonderful communicator. And that's, that's good. Uh, one more thing. Turn to the person closest to you, and hopefully it's someone you know, and ask them if you are a good communicator or not. What do you think? Yeah. Now remember, Jesus tells us to speak the truth in love. <laughs> speak the truth in love. Don't be mean, but yeah, ask your neighbor. So at the 9 o'clock service, I was silly enough to ask Cora, who was sitting right over there. I asked Cora, I said, honey, am I a good communicator? And she looks up and goes, that's what I learned opening my mouth like that to my wife during the sermon. So, oh, she knows. But... She's not necessarily wrong either. I have moments in which I am not a good communicator. Overall, I hope I am, but we're going to get to that a little later. Well, if that made you uncomfortable, we're going to continue on with that wonderful awkwardness by looking at eight different questions to actually evaluate yourself to see if you are a good communicator. If you're not normally a communicator, if you're not normally a person that follows along with the little insert in your bulletin, please do, uh, because there is room for you to write down and take notes and hopefully take this home with you this week uh, and look at what's going on. So I see I have eight questions that are on your insert for the sermon this week, uh, and so I want you to write down your answer for what you do most of the time, right? So if you do, if you, if, like the first one says, do you have a message? When you speak, most of the time, if you have a message, you can write yes for that one. Maybe take some notes. But like if that one time back in 1995 you had a message and not any time since then, don't write yes for that. We're talking generalized here more often than not. All right? So that is the first one. Do you have a message? This is an important point because I've a good communicator needs to know what you want to say before you say it or before you type it. The younger generation does most of their communication either via text or on social media. So you need to know what your message is before you say it or before you press send on social media. I've met a lot of people who talk wonderfully and have eloquent sentences but absolutely do not have a point. They just want to hear themselves talk. Uh, and that's I guess okay, but that's not a good communicator. So to be a good communicator, you want to know what that point is before you say it or before you type it. Um, and you know what you want it to sound like as well. That's just as important. Because here, let me say two different things and say if you can tell the difference between the two. What's the message I want to say when I say, oh, I love that dress. Where did you get that? It means I actually like that person. I think they look nice. The dress fits well on them. What's the meaning of this sentence? Where did you get that dress? <laughs> yeah, not the same thing, right? <laughs> not quite the same thing. So your tone of voice is just as important as what you are saying to get that message across to somebody else. Second question. If you want to be a good communicator, hopefully you use stories or data. Do you individually use stories or data to make your point? Right? Stories are a great way to connect emotionally with somebody else when you're trying to communicate with them. And stories are way more memorable than just words. Right? Does anybody re can anybody recite to me either the I Have a Dream speech from Martin Luther King Jr. or Abraham Lincoln's you know, second address? Uh, yeah, they're, they're nice in their speeches, their words, but who knows the story of the three little pigs? Yeah, we remember that story. I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. We remember that story. So stories stick with us. They connect with us on a more emotional level, and, and we learn, hopefully, what the point is from the story. 
if you can't quite use a story to make your point, hopefully you at least then have some data to back it up. Now, let me make this perfectly clear. It is okay to make up a story to make your point. Jesus did that. But it's not okay to make up data to make up your point, okay? Just because you want to be right is not a good enough reason to make up, oh yeah, no, three out of four doctors say that I need to take this. You don't know that. That's a big fat lie. Let's not make up data to make sure that we're making our point. Okay, question number three. Do you use active voice? Who's having some high school English class flashbacks right now? The active voice is a a style of communication. So here's what I'm going to do. I have two sentences. One's in the active voice and one's in the passive voice. And I want you to see if you can tell which one's which. Okay. The sermon for this week was written by me. That's number one. Number two is I wrote the sermon for this week. Anybody know which one the active one was? Number two, yes, we have a couple of language scholars. All right, very good. I didn't learn language until I was in seminary, but that's another story altogether. But yes, number two is the active voice. You want to you wanna just say it. Um, the, the idea is to not just dance around what you're saying. No, just come out and say it and make that point. So using an active voice is a good way to be a good communicator. Question number four, do you use jargon or cliches? <laughs> yeah. Um, so if I am had a pastor's meeting and I use, you know, I asked the question, are you a super lapsarian or supra lapsarian? Which one of those are you? Now, if that went over your head, that's totally okay because those are just religious words that only pastors learn in seminary and we use them to make ourselves feel smart. No other reason. You don't need to know that by any means. That's what jargon does though, right? That's what jargon is. It's very technical language that only a few people would know, and it makes other people in the room maybe not feel so smart if you use that around them. So that's a bad communication. You want to write no for number four, just in case you were wondering. Cliches are the same thing. They're tired phrases that everybody knows, but they've kind of gone past their prime, right? So if I said in a sermon, God is one in a million, a few of you would probably roll your eyes like, come on, really? One in a million? Come up with something a little bit more relevant than that. And that's what cliches do as well. So hopefully you wrote no for number four. That would be what you want. So don't do that. (laughs) Number five is my favorite, but also the hardest one to talk about. Are you overly wordy (laughs) or very brief? (laughs) Now, as a minister, it's very hard to answer this question. (laughs) Ministers tend to want to say more than we have to. But I've also had many experiences with people who only give one-word answers that leave things open to interpretation. So you don't want to be too wordy, and you don't want to be too brief. And also in this same one, if you use sounds more than you use words, that's being a little brief too, men. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, we, we sometimes time to grunt and think that's communicating. So it's not exactly the right way that we want to do when communicating to people. So think about it this way. When you're communicating with somebody else, you don't want to be the mama bear, you don't want to be the papa bear, you want to be baby bear. That's just right. Not too wordy and not too brief, but just right. Question number seven asks, are you direct? Some people really enjoy taking a long time to get to the point, especially if it's a difficult subject matter. I get it. It's tough. You don't want to talk about stuff they talk about in health class with your teenager. I understand. That's a difficult conversation to have. But if we want to be good communicators, we need to get to what we're talking about. We do not need a five-minute introduction about this topic at hand. Get to the point. And that's okay. See, if I was allowed to say cliches and be a good communicator, I would say, don't beat around the bush. Ah, get it? That one works. Ah, last one. Yay, we're almost done. Question number eight asks, do you get to know the people you are communicating with? This is a very, very good question. Very important. You need to be able to relate to who you are trying to communicate with. And this is something that needs to take place before the actual conversation. You can't get to know somebody right in the middle of when you're trying to communicate a message to them. So think about this. You wouldn't talk to a preschool class in the same way you'd talk to a college class, right? It's a different, different group of people. You wouldn't write an article for the Medina County Gazette in the same way you would write an article for the New Yorker. There are two different audiences that are going to read that. So we need to know that audience. 
All right, you have your eight answers written down, maybe some notes you took. I ask you once again, how good of a communicator are you? It might be a little bit more bleak than the first time when I asked that question, but that's not my goal. I don't want to bum you out today. <laughs> so that's not why, oh, I went to church and Pastor Jay told me I was terrible at communicating with people. No, that's not the goal of this. Hopefully, you can grow in some areas if that's something that you choose to do so, but that's not my intention for this morning. I want to ask us, though, why is this important? Why did I even do this little exercise that took a few minutes out of my sermon? Well, what's the point of what we do as Christians? The point is to go out into the world and spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who have no idea who he is. And I would hate for us to be the ones giving the message and communicating it poorly so someone does not necessarily understand or grip grip grasp excuse me who jesus is because like me you communicated it poorly that's the idea now the good news is the holy spirit comes alongside people and he's the one that needs to regenerate a heart for it to a stick but we can do a better job of being good communicators to share the good news of jesus christ wherever we go I want, to, want you to flip the page on our, uh, on our sermon insert and switch gears for uh, one more section. Is God, one more question, excuse me, is God a good communicator? Right? The good Sunday school answer is, oh yeah, yeah, God's a good communicator, we all know that. And, but I'm going to put him to the test this morning. I'm going to ask the same eight questions that I asked you to ask yourselves about God. And we're going to talk about how God is a good communicator. Our passage for this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 55. We're going to read verses 6 through 11. And in this passage, we have God's message directly to the Israelites about how to reconcile with him. He knew that the Israelites would screw up and that they would need to have that reconciliation with God. So he gave them this passage to explain to them how to do that. And also, he, in this passage, talked about what do we need to know as his people, as his children, when he communicates with us. So if you would, please follow along as I read for us Isaiah chapter 55, reading verses 6 through 11. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he, our God, will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that comes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So the grass withers and the flowers fade away, but the words of God abide forever. How often would you say this rhetorical question, you don't have to raise your hands, but how often would you say that you think like this? You know, I think God is approving what I am doing in my life right now. I think God really likes my plans for what's going on in my life right now. I'm thinking about my will and not God's will. How often do we do that? As we've been reading through these experiencing, uh, this Experiencing God book together, I've been reminded how often, too many times, that I think about my plans and how little I think about God's. And that's the problem in our world today more uh, excuse me verse 8 of our passage just told us that his thoughts are not our thoughts his ways are not our ways so maybe just maybe god doesn't approve of our plans if we're not thinking the way he would think also his ways are higher than our ways we need to be thinking like he thinks instead of the other way around I think that's the perspective that we need in our lives. And I know that it is one that only comes through this daily interaction with God. We need to daily say to ourselves, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for this church? What is God's will, period? And then how do we come alongside that? 
I don't think that anyone else does this, but you know, I don't wake up in the morning and think to myself, all right, how am I going to do my plans and not do God's plans today? Yes, I'm excited. Like a coach giving a speech at halftime. I'm ready to go do my own plans. No, we don't do that. What happens is we get up and we get into our routine and we go to work or we do whatever we do and we just forget about God's plans because life happens. I don't hear me say that so you feel guilty or, or worse about yourself. We do it. So what do we need to do to fix that? We need to make time for our relationship with God. We need to have what Blackaby calls that deep love relationship between God and ourselves. We need to be having that daily time with him in his word, in prayer, with other Christians, that we can think about who God is and stop thinking about ourselves so much. Verse 11 of what we just read tells us that God's word is so powerful that it goes out from God's mouth, it will not return empty, but he will accomplish what he desires and will achieve the purpose for which he sent it. So while we may not be great communicators and we may not always accomplish what we want when we have conversations, God truly is and he truly does. So let's put him to the test. Let's take a look at those same eight questions we use to evaluate ourselves. First one is, does God have a message? Well, I would say yes to that one. In that passage we read, God has many messages and many words and each one has its own specific purpose. When it goes out into the world, it will not come back to God without first doing what he wanted it to. There are some verses listed as well, some quick references of some of God's major messages that he gives to us in Scripture, right? John 3.16, we understand that God loves us so very much that he sent his son to die for us. The gospel in a quick verse. And then another message of what are we supposed to do as his disciples and followers in Matthew 28, it shows Jesus' last message is the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. Those are the messages of God that we need to hear and understand. Take, Take a second and write down what message might God have for you this morning. Through his words in Isaiah or anything else that you heard, the songs we sing, what we're doing. What might God's message be for you today. Question number two, does God use stories or data? Well, if you've read through the Bible, you know that about 60% of the Bible is story, is narrative, is what we call it. God uses that to teach us because he knows that it's going to stick better with us than just a speech or a sermon or whatever we use here on earth. Then, also, not only do we have a lot of story and narrative, the book of Numbers and and those genealogies that you normally skip when we're reading through the Gospels, those are also data used to back up God's point. God does both of those things. God also used his son Jesus, and Jesus taught us through parables. Those are the two verses that are listed down there. Uh, Under question number two are the parable of the Good Samaritan and the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus knew that we would remember those stories more than we would just remember his words for our life. Question number three asks if God uses the active voice, and once again, the answer is yes. God's name is in the active voice. I am who I am when God reveals himself to Moses at the burning bush. I think that's kind of fun. Jesus tells us the same thing. He uses the active voice. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's the active voice, who Jesus really is. I don't think those verses would have the same impact if they would have used a more passive voice. Question number four, if God asks if God uses jargon or cliches, this one's quick and easy, no. There aren't any of those in the Bible, so let's just move on to number five. Right? You like it when it goes quick in a sermon. So number five question asks, If God is overly wordy or overly brief. Now, this one might be a little bit, yeah. Hold up your Bibles, right, if you brought them with you. They're pretty thick, right? (laughs) You might think by that, yeah, God is overly wordy. Well, no, because there's a whole bunch of messages in that thick Bible. God often uses just the right amount because he knows us so well. He knows how many times we need to hear something to get the point. Sometimes it's one. Sometimes it's way more than one. 
So he knows to say it over and over and over again how much God loves us. All right. Oh, and Jesus warns us as well, excuse me, and to warns us not to pray too long like the Pharisees do. Right? He tells us, don't just stand on the corners and pray for hours and hours because that's just what the Pharisees do and all they want to do is make themselves look good. So that's our goal is to not be too wordy or too brief as well, just like God is. All right, question number six, does God ask for feedback? And this one's so interesting. God is the creator of the world. We heard Shelvis exclaim for us in Psalm 148 that he created everything through his words. So he doesn't need any feedback. He knows how to communicate to us. But guess what? He still asks for it. He still is really good at that. Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Looking for that feedback of his closest group of friends. And God wants our feedback too, right? He calls it prayer. That's when we give our feedback back to him and we worship him and do those things. So even though God doesn't have to do that, he chooses to ask us for feedback. Question seven asks, is God direct? And I don't think anyone is more direct than God himself. He gets to the point. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not a doctoral thesis on the doctrine of salvation. He said it in two short phrases. Once again, Jesus uh, tells us in Matthew chapter 7, ask it when it will be given it to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. It's very, very direct and to the point in these passages we know so well. Last but not least, question number eight asks, did God take time to get to know his people? We've already talked about it. God created every single one of us. He, he knew us while we were still in our mother's womb, and God knows us better than we know ourselves. But that didn't stop him from getting to know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God knew how Abraham would respond, but he tested him anyway. God wrestled with Jacob. Can you imagine that? I'm not a good wrestler, but I, I, that'd be a good way to get to know who God is. God got to know Moses on the mountain and in the desert for 40 years as he led God's stiff-necked people through the desert. And God really wanted to get to know us, so he sent his son Jesus himself down to earth for 35 years to live with, to eat with, to experience us as people. So God knows us very well, but he still wants us to have that relationship with him that only gets deeper and deeper each day of our lives wants us to be more like Christ. So I ask again, do you think God is a good communicator? I hope your answer is yes. So the only question that remains is how do we respond to God's communication? If God is the best communicator that we know through his word and through his Holy Spirit, uh, which we just saw that he is, how do we respond? We can respond with fear that causes us not to move like a deer in headlights. We hear God's word and we just stop because we can't grasp what he's saying to us. We can respond by justifying our own plans, our own agendas, and our own thoughts and say, nope, you know what, God, I think I got a pretty good plan. I, I don't really want yours. I hope you see how those are bad options. Third option is a good one. We can respond in faith. Henry Blackaby, at the end of chapter 11 of Experiencing God, says this, and the quote's right there for you. God wants us to know him and follow him. As he speaks to us, he reveals his nature so that we can have faith to trust him in the assignment he calls us to do. He reveals his purposes so we will become involved in his work and not just dream up plans of what we will do for him. God reveals his ways so that he will accomplish his work through us in a manner that gives him glory and shows that he is God. It sounds to me like through this quote and through our passage that we read today, if you hear nothing else this morning, hear this, that it's not about us. It's about him. That we need to focus on his words, his phrases, his actions, what he wants for us if we want to succeed in this world today at living out his purpose for us.
We should be focused on his work and making sure that he gets the glory for whatever we do. I always end my sermons with a challenge or multiple challenges. But this week, I want to do things a little different. I have two blank lines at the end of your sermon outline because this week I want you to come up with your own challenges. I, of course, will have some suggestions, have no fear. But uh, if you want to write something down on those lines and put them somewhere this week where you can look at it, focus it, and focus on it and challenge yourself, I think you'll get more done if you challenge yourself than if I just challenge you. But here's some suggestions. Your challenges could be to improve on one or more of the areas of communication this week. There are eight of them listed there for you. Work on it. Heck, pick one a day and work on it each day this week. Continue to improve on the way we communicate so when the time comes to share the gospel with someone, you can do it in an effective and clear way. So maybe you want to make sure you have a clear message or stop using cliches or get to know the people that you communicate with better. That's a good thing to challenge yourself with this week. Another challenge could be uh, to work hard at communicating well with everyone consistently. Ah, this one's tough. Because maybe you're a good communicator with your family, with your spouse, with your kids. Or maybe you're a good communicator at work, but not at home. What we want to work on is being an effective and good communicator with everyone. So that everyone receives our best communication. Maybe your challenge this week would be uh, to respond in faith when you hear God speak. Instead of responding with fear or with justification. Maybe another challenge could be to uh, put down your own ways and agendas and start following God's ways that he has for your life. Who knows? Maybe it's something completely different. Maybe you feel God challenging you this morning. Write it down. And then do the best thing. Just don't leave it here. Take God's word with you when you go home this week and when you go to work and go wherever you go. Take God's word with you. Take his challenges with you and focus on it so that your relationship can become deeper and deeper. Bring God's word back here this week from 6.30 to 9 and share it with the kids who are going to be here singing and dancing and screaming and yelling and crying and all of the above. But they need to hear God's word just as much as we do. Don't leave it in this room. Take it with you this week. So even if you're not a communicator, good communicator right now, that's okay. You can always work on it and get better. Follow God's example and his leading that we have right in front of us and respond in faith to what he wants. Because his ways are higher than our ways. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for being a God who decided to speak to us and reveal himself to us. We learned last week, God, from Pastor Dan that you are a God who speaks And this week we learn, God, that you do it well. You reveal yourself to us and you give us your Holy Spirit to let us know who you are. So, Father, we pray that we hear you clearly. Quiet our hearts to hear your voice. And then allow us to respond in faith. Allow us to have the courage to step out, not on our own power, but in your power, to raise our game this week for each person that walks in this door. Help us, Lord, to be a good communicator so when that time comes that we get to share our story, which is your story in us, that we can do it clearly, effectively, and right to the point. Thank you, God, for always being with us in our communication. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, at this time, we will continue to worship God by giving of our tithes and our offerings. Uh, And Pastor Dan is going to share a few uh, prayer concerns with us this morning. We have offered time of prayer after the service with our elders. If uh, you just need to talk to somebody and communicate some things or have communicated prayer to you as we lift those things up to God, um, we'll be back uh, by the uh, chair lift, which is a great location because as that chair lift lifts people physically, we can pray for you and lift you up spiritually as well. 
Uh, a couple things, uh, Jenny Ranke was released from the hospital on Wednesday and was released to a rehab facility. So if you've been uh, following uh, the updates on her, uh, that's where she is at this point and still recovering. Also, we want to pray for uh, Dick Sensaba. He had a fall this uh, week and he broke his finger and chipped his front tooth and cut his lip pretty good. And so he's at home recovering. So pray for him as, as he goes through that recovery process. And uh, I get the privilege of inviting Shelvis to come back up. Uh, Shelvis is uh, our missionary that we support to the uh, South Sudan. Uh, we often get his newsletters and we make them available to you on uh, the literature rack and uh, we pray for them. If you've seen our newsletter, our newsletter for the month, uh, we're highlighting the missions of our, not only our church but the denomination and, uh, and Shelvis and his wife Nancy and kids uh, are some of our missionaries that we support and so we have the privilege of having him with us this morning and he would like to share an update on what's going on on the mission field in his family and also uh, lift up a prayer uh, for our congregation and for the missions across this world. So, Shelvis, thanks for being with us. As he shared, I'm Shelvis, an RCA missionary, and I am so thankful for your partnership in ministry. In the last few weeks, my wife and I have traveled from East Africa we started in Arua, Uganda, took a 10-hour drive to Entebbe, Uganda. We boarded a plane from Uganda on to Amsterdam, which was 7 to 10 hours, and then continued from Amsterdam across the waters to Atlanta with um, a 7-year-old, a 5-year-old, and a 2-and-a-half-year-old. Those of you with babies know what that's like. <laughs> we crossed three continents, several time zones. And we traveled for a long time, but we came because we wanted to thank RCA churches that have been supporting us, have been partnering with us in mission for years. And this is not the first time that I've been here. In fact, in 2011, my wife and I came uh, while uh, Pastor Dunn was serving in, as the lead pastor here before the baton was passed to these great leaders that are here. My wife and I came. We were two at that time. And as God would allow it, since we've been serving in South Sudan, God gave us one, then two, and now three. Your mission team has grown. <laughs> and while your mission team has been serving in South Sudan, we've been thinking about you and we've been praying for you. In fact, in April, I called the, I called the church to simply share that, that my son Jordan, my daughter Adeline, and my youngest daughter, Nicole, they were praying for you all. They didn't know everything that was going on. They knew it was Easter time. Wherever you are in the world, it's Easter time. It's time for God to celebrate God's resurrection. And we were trusting that you were doing it in a way that was honoring God. So we were praying for you all. And you may not see my children here, but know that they're here in spirit because they're thinking about you. And you may not ever have the opportunity to connect with some of the people in the refugee camps that we serve with. But know that what you've been doing has been a blessing for them. One thing that I've learned is that whatever culture I'm in, whatever country I'm in, whatever time zone I'm in with those little bitty kids, there are some things that translate across. And that term, amen, is a term that translates because wherever we are, it means it is so where we agree. And I don't care if we're younger or older, there's this song that was offered up when I was a young boy growing up in Atlanta. And our congregation would sing it. It would just, it was these simple words. Everybody say amen. Everybody say amen. Everybody say amen. Uh-huh. Amen. Okay. okay, I think we know that song. <laughs> Can we sing it like we know it? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Sometimes that song we start clapping, huh? Yeah. Now everybody say, hey. Everybody say, hey. Everybody say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. A little louder say, hey. Uh-huh. A little louder say, hey. A little louder say, yeah, yeah, yeah. A little soft 
softer now. Mm -hmm. A little softer now. A little softer now. Amen. Amen. Wherever we are, if we're within this Brunswick church family, or we're in the refugee camps in East Africa, we say amen because we agree that God is at work. And I know that God is at work here. But the vacation Bible school that you all are preparing for, for the mission trip that you all will be doing in Kentucky, is that right? For the Beulah work that will be going on for the middle school, I know that God is at work here. In the Habitat for Humanity that will be going on, for the dancers that come here and the music that's offered, sometimes you all sing traditional songs that many people know. Other times you sing songs that are not as popular, but God still hears the prayers. And we know that God is at work in the midst. Amen? Amen. I have the opportunity to tell you how God has been at work in South Sudan through your support, through your partnership. Some of you all know that in 2011, South Sudan became the newest nation in the world while simultaneously becoming one of the poorest nations in the world, one of the least educated nations in the world, at least formally. Not only that, it had some of the, le the fewest amounts of resources in a particular country. And while those challenges were present, while those challenges still are present, God is at work, amen? amen. South Sudanese Christians, South Sudanese Reformed folks, South Sudanese Methodist folks, South Sudanese Baptist folks, South Sudanese Catholic folks came together and said, how can we be a part of addressing the challenges that face our congregations and our communities? And this congregation several years ago chose to support Debbie and Del Broxma as they were sent as RCA missionaries to work with those church leaders. And then my wife Nancy and I had the opportunity to join in with what the church was already doing. What we've specifically been doing is working with an organization called Reconcile. And Reconcile brings together leaders from around the nation of South Sudan to train them and to better equip them to address issues of conflict and issues of trauma. Some of the people that we've trained are like a young lady named Lucy Awate. I like saying the name Awate because it makes me, makes me smile, Awate. Lucy Awate, she was already doing great work in the community that she was serving in South Sudan. She was working with young children who had faced all sorts of challenges. Some of them were orphaned. Some of them were living with AIDS, HIV. Some of them had been tortured and unfortunately had been raped. She was working with them and she needed more skills to better do the work. So she came to be a participant in the Reconcile Peace Institute that I've been helping to develop. And after receiving training, she went back into those communities. And not only did she continue to do great work in those communities, but when Reconcile and its staff went to those communities, she worked alongside with the staff. Not only that, Lucy became the first student who became an instructor at the Reconcile Peace Institute. Not only that, Lucy became one of the first students to become staff of Reconcile. And as I speak today, Lucy is preparing herself She's preparing herself to come to the U.S., where she has been selected as an international peacemaker for the Presbyterian Church USA. Lucy, during the last few years, has not only worked with young children who've had challenges, but she's also worked with the warlords. Just a few weeks ago, she held a training with political leaders, helping them to address issues of trauma. For the last year and a half, I've had the honor and the privilege to work side by side with Lucy in one of the largest refugee camps in Africa, filled with many of those South Sudanese who have fled. And Lucy has been able to do some of those things because of the partnership and the support that's come from you all. Whether you know it or not, each year this congregation and our denomination send prayers and support that allows for these leaders to receive this training and offer prayer and support so these leaders can help other leaders to be able to do this training. So I've come all of these miles all of this way, pushing through time zones with cranky kids to be able to say thank you for what you have done and to say thank you for what you will do. Because what you do matters here. 
I am so thankful for you all. When I called to say, can I come worship with you all? I didn't know if I would have the opportunity to speak or not. I knew it would be enough to be able to come and sit and worship just to hear you sing God's praise. Because when I go back to, over to that side, I'll be able to tell them about you. I'll be able to tell them about Miss, Miss George that I met who's 90 years old this morning. I'll be able to tell her about the, the praise dancers. I can't remember the name. The Power Up crew. <laughs> I'll be able to tell them about you so that they can pray for you. While they're praying for you, please pray for them. Pray what, for what God is doing in their midst. Because we believe that even though there are challenges there in South Sudan, God is at work. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now I have the opportunity to pray for you all. Please bow your heads. Eternal God, in the beginning you created the heavens and the earth. Your hands pushed down what was muddy soil. And you hewed into it valleys and mountains, dear God. You named what was unknown. You flung stars in the sky and you hung the sun in the air. You rotated the earth on its axis, dear God. You looked at all of these things, Lord, and you said, it is good. You saw the chaos and you made order and you said, it is good. You saw the darkness and you made light and you said, it is good. You saw what was seen as nothing and you made it something and you said, it is good. And God, I believe today that even as we, your followers, your believers, the Brunswick Church family come together in the midst of challenges in the community here and challenges in other communities around the world, Lord, you call us to be a part of the creating spirit that you've given us, Lord. To dig our hands in the midst of dirt, dear God, and somehow create something good to venture into the chaos and the uncertainty, and to know that what we're doing is good. So God, I pray your blessings on this congregation, Lord. Whether it's the Green Thumb group that's going out and trying to uh, lift up some crops and some plants here, whether it's the people that put in the time to set up this, th these race cars and these gorillas in the pulpit here to excite children about the Lord, whatever it may be, dear God, I pray that you would Allow us to reach in the uncertainty around us and create something good for you. God, allow us to do it as a community and allow us to do it individually, Lord. Allow us to search our hearts to see how we best can serve you and honor you and glorify you, dear God. Lord, I pray specifically on this day for those who have experienced brokenness. It's been named that there are some who are dealing with health challenges and sickness, dear God. Their bodies have been hurt. Their spirits have been wounded. And God, we pray for them, Lord. And just as we pray for those who have dealt with physical challenges today, we also pray for those who are dealing with the internal challenges, the emotional challenges that are not always seen but are still there. Some of those are sick and shut in in those homes, and, 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 and some of us are right here in the congregation, Lord. But God, our prayer is that you would meet us where we're at, Lord, that once again we would feel your loving hands holding us, touching us, speaking life into us, and allowing us to be your good servants doing your good work. This is the prayer that we pray together, saying amen. amen. Thanks, Shellis. Well, let us sing our closing song. It's a new song this morning, and so we invite you to stand and join with us. Reflect upon these words and the message that it conveys about asking God to speak and listening to what he has to say. Yeah. 
everything he says is life to us. So our only question then is how are we going to respond? I think we can do it in three simple ways. First, we quiet our hearts and listen to what he has to say. Second, we respond in faith. And third, we share the good news, communicating it well to those that he's given us to speak to. I don't think that's that hard. I think we can do it. I think when he is with us, he stays with us at all times. That with his love and with his power, he will speak through us. So as we go from this place, go knowing that it is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the power and fellowship of his Holy Spirit that will be with you now and always. Amen. Let's close with the benediction. Stand up with the chairs, that'd be great.